Hello once again, I'm Jerry Savelle. Welcome to our broadcast today. As you can tell, we're still in downtown Fort Worth. I'm preaching in the Kenneth Copeland Believers Convention. This is our 40th year for this convention in Fort Worth and people have come from all over the world. It's been exciting and I'm gonna be sharing with you today a message that I preached in the convention entitled, Staying Connected to God the Provider. God is our provider. He wants to supply all of your need according to His riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Now I wanna teach you today on how you can stay connected to God the Provider. So I'm gonna take you into that service where I was teaching this. It's a powerful message that I know you're going to enjoy. So I wanna encourage you to watch closely right now as we share about this important truth from the Word of God. God is your source of supply. God is your provider. So watch now, and I'll be back a little later with some closing remarks. What I wanna to talk to you about this afternoon is staying connected to God the provider. Staying connected to God our provider. Genesis chapter 12 and verse one, you're very familiar with it. And the Lord had said unto Abram, get thee out of thy country, from thy kindred, from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation and I will bless thee, make thy name great. Thou shalt be a blessing. I'll bless those that bless you. Notice once again in verse two, and I will bless thee. Now the word bless means to empower, to prosper, to empower, to multiply, to empower, to increase to empower, to excel. So in essence, what God is saying is, I'm gonna be your source of supply. Yeah. I'm going to be your provider. Now he didn't say it in those exact words, but that's what he's saying. I will bless you. I will bless you. So God is identifying himself as the one who is responsible for Abraham being blessed. Amen. 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 So once again, to bless means to empower, to prosper and to increase and so forth. So once again, in essence, God is saying, I will be your provider. Now in chapter 13, and look at verse two, and Abram was very rich in cattle, in silver and in gold. So notice it's already working for him. One chapter later, and God the provider is already increasing him in silver and in gold, sheep and cattle, everything. God was providing for him. God was showing him and proving to him that what I told you one chapter later or earlier, I will do. I am doing it for you. Praise God. Amen. I like to ask people, how many chapters will it take you <laughs> to become very rich? <laughs> Amen. Yeah. Amen. You're the seed of Abraham, aren't you? Look at somebody and say, I'm the seed of Abraham. And the Bible says that Abraham's blessing belongs to us. We're heirs according to the promise. Can you say amen? amen. Now go to Genesis chapter 17 and verse one. And when Abram was 90 years old and nine, the Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am the almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect and I will make my covenant between me and thee, and I will multiply thee exceedingly. Now in the little Hebrew, I am the almighty God is actually El Shaddai. Look at your neighbor and say El Shaddai. El Shaddai. And El Shaddai is one of the seven covenant names through which God revealed himself to Israel. It means the all sufficient one or the God in whom, or, or the God who is more than enough. The all sufficient one, the God who is more than enough. Now, the apostle Paul picks up on this and many, many years later, centuries later, he says in Ephesians chapter three, verse 20, referring to El Shaddai, now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh within us. The Amplified Bible says he's able to do super abundantly far above or far over and above all that we dare ask or think. 
infinitely beyond our highest prayers, desires, thoughts, hopes, or dreams. I like to say, if I can dream it, God can do it bigger than that. If I can think it, God can do it bigger than that. If I can imagine it, God can do it bigger than that. Amen. Somebody shout, yes, he can. Yes, he can. And give him a little bit of praise. Woo! Hallelujah. Amen. Yes. He's the God that does super abundantly above all that we can ask or think. Now the message translation says, God can do anything, you know, far more than you could ever imagine or guess or request in your wildest dreams. I get some pretty wild dreams. How about you? Amen. I've always been a dreamer ever since I was a little boy. I always, I always dreamed. You know, I, I, I loved playing baseball when I was a young boy. I started out in Little League and I played all the way up to a farm league that was sponsored by the Kansas City Royals. And I loved playing baseball. And I had ambitions uh, when I was a young boy to play professional baseball. I never did get that far into it, but, uh, and I remember growing up, and of course I was born in 1946. And uh, by the time I, I got to watch my first professional baseball game on television, you know, my, my children think I'm making this up, but uh, there was on, only one family on our road that had a television set. And on Saturdays, they'd put it in their living room window and invite the rest of the neighborhood to bring their lawn chairs and their quilts. And we'd all sit in their front yard and watch your television, black and white, you know, amen. And I remember when my daddy finally got us our first black and white television and the first professional baseball game I ever saw was the New York Yankees. And I became a New York Yankee fan. And I loved Mickey Mantle. Uh -huh. And I loved Roger Marius. Right. I loved Yogi Berra. Anybody ever heard those names? Some yeah. of you are looking at me like, who's that? <laughs> I remember one time, Jesse and I and Kathy and Carolyn, we were in a, a restaurant here in Fort Worth, Razoo's, after one of the meetings one night. And uh, this young girl was the waitress. And she came up to our table and asked us what we wanted to drink. We told her, she came back and she said, I am so sorry, uh, you two must be famous. Uh, everybody in here is trying to buy your meal. Who are you? And I said, well, I'm Tom Selleck and that's Robert Redford. And she said, who's that? <laughs> she was so young, she didn't even know who they were, you know? But anyway, I go back, you know, to Mickey Mantle era. And Mickey Mantle was my favorite player. I had to have everything Mickey Mantle. I had a Mickey Mantle glove. I had a Mickey Mantle bat, a Louisville slugger with Mickey Mantle on it, you know, and, and uh, I wanted his number, you know, when I started out playing Little League. Well, I dreamed as a little boy, man, someday I'd love to go to Yankee Stadium. Well, that was New York City. I live in Shreveport, Louisiana. That seemed like it was a million miles away. In fact, to me, it was a foreign country, you know? What are the odds of a little old boy living in the sticks ever going to New York City to Yankee Stadium and watching Mickey Mantle? And I remember my dad and I would sit and watch the ball game and they'd every once in a while pan the audience and there were boys sitting in that stadium my age and I'd tell my dad, those are the luckiest kids in the world. They get to watch Mickey Mantle, you know. And I remember one time I was, I was uh, uh, at the dentist and uh, the dentist asked me while he was getting ready to work on my teeth. He said, uh, you like baseball? I said, oh yes, that's my favorite sport. He said, who's your favorite player? I said, Mickey Mantle. He said, yeah, it's my, my favorite player too. He said, can you bat left-handed and right-handed just like Mickey? I never thought of that. So I started teaching myself. I was left-handed, but I taught myself how to, write, uh, how to uh, bat right-handed as well. I wanted to be just like Mickey Mantle. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I dreamed as a kid, one day I'm going to go to uh, Yankee Stadium and get to watch Mickey Mantle. 
Well, you know, I grew up. That never happened while I was a young boy. And uh, later when I went in the ministry, uh, I'd been in the ministry for several years. And some friends of mine who live in New York City, actually in New Jersey, but worked in New York City, they asked me to come and spend a few days with them. I had just finished a meeting in Toronto. And so they said, come spend a few days with us. I said, okay. And so they picked me up at JFK and took me out to their home. And they took me up to the bedroom I was going to stay in and, and I'm unpacking. And, and the gentleman said, uh, uh, is there anything you'd like to do while you're in New York City? I said, I'd love to go to Yankee Stadium. You think the Yankees are playing this weekend? He said, well, I don't know, but I'll, I'll call a friend of mine who's a ticket holder and I'll ask him. And so I'm unpacking. In a little while, he come up there and he said, Jerry Savelle, I've never met anybody like you. You do have the favor of God. <laughs> and I had told him about how Mickey Mantle was, you know, my hero when I was growing up. And he said, you do have the favor of God on your life. I said, why? What are you talking about? He said, not only are the Yankees here this weekend, they're playing tomorrow. It's old timers day and Mickey Mantle will be there. <laughs> and he said, and my friend who's a sick season ticket holder wants you to have his seat right over third base. I could almost reach out and touch Mickey. You know, didn't get, get to meet him then. But then it wasn't long after that, Jerry Ann, my daughter Jerry Ann and I were flying to Detroit and we're on American Airlines and, and we were setting up there in, in first class and, and uh, I picked up, while people are still boarding, I picked up the American Way magazine out of the pocket in front of me and it had Mickey Mantle on the front of it. And I showed it to Jerry and I said, that was my hero when I was growing up. And I'm telling her about Mickey Mantle and I looked up, Mickey Mantle comes on board. <laughs> Sits right next to us on the opposite. I'm sitting in the aisle on this side. Mickey Mantle sat on the aisle on that side and he turned and spoke to us. And I said, uh, Mr. Mantle, now I was like a kid, man. I tell you, <laughs> it, it was all I could do to behave myself. I, I almost wanted to cry. <laughs> Mickey Mantle. And... Uh, and I, and I know, you know, he, he gets this all the time. He got that all the time. And, uh, you know, people wanting his autograph and wanting to tell him stories and all that. And I know he heard that all the time. So I don't want to bother him, but I do want to bother him. <laughs> and uh, when he turned and spoke to us, I said, uh, Mr. Mantle, did you know that your photograph is on the cover of the American Way magazine this month? He said, well, I remember them coming out and interviewing me, but I didn't know when it was coming out. I said, well, uh, there's one right there in your pocket, uh, up the seat in front of you. And so he got it out. And so uh, he looked back and at us again. And uh, I said, would you autograph this for my daughter? <laughs> <laughs> he said, oh yeah, I'd be happy to. Why did I have him autograph it for you? You still have that magazine? Then you, it belongs to me. <laughs> and so anyway, he autographed it and then we got to Detroit and landed and we, we met up again in the baggage claim and we talked a little bit and then somebody who was meeting him picked him up and the pastor uh, where I was preaching picked us up and we went to the hotel we were staying in and the, the taxi in front of us, Mickey Mantle got out of it. He's staying in the same hotel. And so when he got out, it was about the same time we got out, and he waved at us, you know, and spoke. And, and then we checked in and went to our rooms. And, and I told Jerry, I said, why don't we go down to the restaurant and have a bite to eat before we get ready for the service? And there was nobody in the restaurant but us. And then Mickey Mantle walks in. <laughs> sits right beside us, you know, and so I got to spend the day just about with Mickey Mantle. Amen. That, that was a dream come true. That was a dream come true. Amen. And that's just, that's awesome the way God sets things up. Amen. And, and I could tell you story after story. I can't think of too many dreams I ever had as a young boy 
that God hadn't brought it to pass and even better than I dreamed it. Amen. Amen. I like what they used to say about Joseph. Here comes that dreamer. Look at your neighbor and say, I'm one of those dreamers. And here the Bible says, or, or I'm implying that it says, if you can dream it, then God can do it bigger than that. Yes. Are there any dreamers in the house today? Yes. Have you got big dreams? Yes. Don't limit God. Don't limit God. I, I remember uh, just a few years ago, actually 2016, I had uh, given my airplane into Brother Copeland's ministry. And his, his children and his grandchildren were, were preaching quite often now. And, and I wanted to bless Brother Copeland's ministry with this airplane so that his children and grandchildren could use it. And it was my second uh, Citation 500 jet that I had owned in the ministry. And I sold it into Brother Copeland's ministry. And I think Jeremy used it quite a bit and different ones. And, and so I'm without an airplane. First time I'd been without an airplane in a long time. And um, Somebody asked me, well, what are you believing for now? And, and I said, well, I'm not sure. And my wife asked me, well, what are you believing for now? And I said, it just came out of me. I'm not sure if I'm believing for another airplane at all. She said, well, that's not like you. It's, it, we haven't been without an airplane since 1974. And uh, she said, well, that's not like you. I said, well, uh, I, I'm not sure that I'm going to be traveling as much as I did up to now. Maybe I'm going to get to stay home a little more and enjoy the fruit of my labor, be around my children, my grandchildren, and, you know, and, and she just kind of looked at me like, yeah, <laughs> I'll believe that when I see it kind of thing, you know. Well, I was not too long after that, I was preaching for Brother Keith and Phyllis in Branson, Missouri. And Keith asked me, well, what are you believing for now? And I told him the same thing. And Keith gave me this, I don't believe that look, you know, and, but he didn't say anything. And he just kind of gave me that look, you know. And, and so then uh, the next place I went was Baltimore. And I flew up there on the commercial airlines and the pastor picked me up at the airport and, and taking me to the hotel. And the um, pastor asked me, well, what kind of airplane are you flying now? He had been a pilot before going into the ministry. He said, I said, well, I actually gave my last airplane away and I, I'm really not, uh, I'm not sure that, that I'm really in need of another airplane right now. And he just kind of looked at me. He said, uh, well, I, I knew you'd owned several airplanes over the years. I think it's strange that you're not believing for one now. And I said, well, I'm just not really locked into that right now. And so I preached for him that night. And after the service, he introduced me to all of his family and they wanted to take me out to eat. So we went to eat and uh, I didn't get back to the hotel till nearly one o'clock in the morning. And then I had to fly out of Baltimore and go to Philadelphia the next morning. So I'm, when I got back to the hotel, I'm kind of putting things away that I didn't need for the rest of the night so I wouldn't have to deal with it the next morning. And so I'm hanging my suit up and I'm getting ready to put it in the suit bag. And the Lord said, are you done? Are you through? I said, done and through with what? He said, the ministry. I said, no, I'm not done and through with the ministry. He said, then what did I tell you when you went in the ministry in 1969? I said, well, you said several things to me. What are you referring to? He said, about aviation. I said, you told me I wouldn't be able to fulfill what I'm called to do without airplanes in my ministry. He said, well, are you done? Are you through? 
I said, no, I'm not through. He said, then whose idea was it not to believe for another airplane? Well, I already knew I was caught. <laughs> I couldn't say, Jesse told me. <laughs> no, no. I said, well, apparently it was my idea. He said, yes, it was. He said, I ask you again, are you done? Are you through? I said, no, I'm not through. He said, when, what makes you think you can do what I've called you to do without airplanes now if you're not through? I said, I stand corrected. He said, and what else did I tell you? I said, you told me you never, you did not want me to ever fly airplanes that debt on them. He said, then are you back on your faith for your next debt free airplane? I said, yes, sir, I am. He said, have I honored that all these years? I said, yes, sir, you have. I've flown nine debt free airplanes since 1969. And he said, well, get back on your faith. So I stood corrected. And as soon as I got home, I said, Carolyn, forget what I told you about not believing for my next airplane. She said, I didn't think that'd last long. <laughs> I said, I'm back on my faith. And I told her what I had experienced there. And so I got to thinking about, well, what kind of airplane do I want? Well, I had flown not too long before that, uh, just a test flight in a Citation Mustang. It was a, a new little uh, small jet that Citation came out with. Very economical jet. In fact, you could fly it not much more than what it cost for a, a twin prop. And uh, I thought, well, if, I, if I'm not going to travel as much, maybe, maybe that would be good for me. And I, and I thought, I'll just believe for a new one, you know. And so it wasn't long after that, Keith Moore called me. Brother Jerry, uh, Phyllis and I have been talking. Are you sure that you're not going to be involved in aviation anymore? You're not going to believe for another airplane? I said, I told him the story about Baltimore. And I said, well, Keith, um, actually, uh, I've been corrected. And I'm back on my faith for my next one. And I think... Uh, what I'd like to have is a Citation Mustang. We talked a little more and we hung up. He called back in a few days and he said, Brother Jerry, are you sure you want a Citation Mustang? I said, well, I'm not saying thus saith the Lord, but it's a nice little airplane and uh, I could pay cash for it. And uh, he said, well, we're believing for our next airplane and I just wanted to know, if I gave you the airplane I'm flying now, would you receive it? There was a Citation 5, much bigger, much faster, hold more people. I said, is the Pope Catholic? <laughs> yes, sir, I would receive it. He said, well, I'm sowing it into your ministry, believing for my airplane, my next airplane. And so they flew it down here and we met and prayed over it and all. And Keith said, now, it's a great airplane and, and you can fly it just like it is right now, but down the road, you're going to have to do some upgrades. Well, before Keith even delivered the plane, one of my board members in Australia had sold a company and he wanted to send me a portion of the tithe from this company. And he, that, that portion of that tithe arrived before Keith gave me the airplane. And that portion of that tithe was a half a million dollars. And when the plane came, I decided, well, why wait down the road to do all these upgrades? Why not do them right now and I'll have a brand new airplane? And so I did, I sent it to the shop and upgraded all the avionics, state-of-the-art avionics. I, I put a new paint job on it. I put new interior on it. It is the finest Citation 5 in the sky. And then I put in the galley, Ephesians 3.20, above and beyond. Amen. 
Every time you walk in my airplane, that's one of the first things you'll see, above and beyond. What am I saying? Don't limit God. He does exceeding abundantly, super abundantly, all that we can ask or think. That's God. I said, that's God. Do you need God to meet your financial needs? Have you ever wondered how to convince God to bless you? Today's special offer contains Jerry Savelle's prophetic book, Principles of Supernatural Increase, and his three CD series, Increase God's Way. In this revealing special package, Dr. Jerry Savelle clearly sets forth the biblical principles of supernatural increase, including your covenant right to increase, how God moves supernaturally, and common deceptions that bring poverty and defeat. God desires that you move to a higher level in every area of your life, spiritually, financially, professionally, and socially. You don't have to convince God to bless you. It's already His plan. Don't delay. Call or go online now to jerrysavelle.org and request your copy of the Supernatural Increase Special Package. Embracing these principles on a consistent basis, you'll soon experience supernatural increase as never before. Thank you again for joining me today. And I want to remind you that part two is coming up next week. So be sure and make your plans to join with me. You don't want to miss it. God is your provider. Say that with me. God is my provider. He wants to supply every need in your life. He doesn't only want to supply every need. He wants you to be full. He wants you to overflow. He wants you to be so blessed that you can be a blessing to others. So we're going to continue this message next week. And once again, I want to encourage you to join with me. Before we leave the air, let me remind you our special resource package, three CDs on Increase God's Way. These messages are so powerful that I know they're going to bless you and they're going to inspire your faith. And then my newest book, Principles of Supernatural Increase. This is right hot off the press, and I know that it will be a blessing to you. So place your order. If you want to follow the information that's on the screen right now, you can do so, or you can go to jerrysavelle.org, and all the ordering information is there as well. Place your order right away. Do it right now while it's fresh on your mind, and we'll send them to you just as quickly as we possibly can. So once again, join me for part two on God is your provider. How to stay connected to God, your provider. Until then, remember that your faith will overcome the world. I'll see you again next week.